Galatians. If you don't have your own copy of the Scripture with you this evening, as I say sometimes, just look frantically around you and uh, hopefully someone will notice and hand you one already open up to Galatians because we do have a lot of extra Bibles in the room this evening. And the reason for that is because we want the Bible to have the place of primacy or primacy in our, in our worship service. The honest truth of the matter is that you could remove just about any element from a worship service and still worship. But if you take away the preaching of the Word of God on a regular basis, uh, you really don't have anything that's worth anything because that's the part of the service really where God speaks. Uh, God has spoken at different times to God to His people different ways. In the Old Testament primarily, uh, God did give, had given the law and given it a prime place. I was just a week or two ago reading how that God instructed the kings of Israel actually to copy out their own copy. When you became a king of Israel, you're supposed to copy out your own copy of the law. And if you've ever done any memorization or any learning, you realize that one, a really good method of just fo that causes you to focus and to memorize is to actually write out the scripture. Uh, most of you know uh, Larry and Maria Pieri, and when they were staying with us about a month or so ago, that was one of the projects they were doing was copying out the New Testament of the Scripture, not because they were trying to you know, write a copy of the Scripture so they could give it to somebody, but because it's just a good method of study, just to write something, write it out. And the kings of Israel were supposed to copy out the first five books in the Bible, and then they were supposed to have that copy for themselves. Why? Well, because if you're going to judge God's people, then you need to know God's law. And the way to know God's law would be to have written it and to have, a, have your own working copy of it so that you can effectively apply it. And so I want to encourage you. I, I don't know what Bible study methods that you use, but keep it fresh as a believer. Don't get caught in a rut. Don't think that everybody needs to do the thing that was really, really a help to you, although you could share that. You ever met the person that the thing they needed is what everyone needed? Sort of like the essentials oil, essential oils people. By the way, they're all catching the flu right now. All my essential oils people are complaining about the flu on uh, social media right now. So they must not have an essential oils to keep you from catching the flu. Uh, it surprises me. I thought there would be something you'd rub between your toes or uh, you know, put under your eyelid or something to keep you from catching the flu. <laughs> I, I shouldn't make fun too much. Uh, but all that being said, uh, you know, everybody has their thing that really helped them. Most of the people that are doing multi-level marketing, for instance, actually were usually helped by the product that they're trying to sell because they had something that, that it needed. But not everybody needs what you need. You know what I'm saying? In other words, uh, every diabetic is helped by taking insulin normally, but I, don't, I wouldn't be helped by the same thing. So be careful about being helped by something and then thinking, well, no one's spiritual or no one loves God unless they study the Bible the way that I do. And let me just throw some things out there that I found that are a real help. Reading through the Bible in a year, if you've never done that, everyone ought to, and that would be a real help. doesn't mean that's the only method for Bible study, but it it's, gives you an overview of the Scripture done in a timely manner that will help you spiritually. Reading a proverb every day, particularly for young people, is really helpful. There being 31 proverbs, Generally speaking, if you just read the proverb for the day of the month and maybe read an extra one at the end of the month, then that'll help you. That's a good method for Bible study. Uh, but there are a lot of other methods, and they ought to be used. And so I just want to just kind of chat with you a little bit about that. But I'll tell you what will help you more than anything else is making a lot out of this book. Because God used to speak to us by prophets and by the law, or God used to speak to us, uh, through apostles in the early church. But today God speaks to us through His Word, by His Word. And so if you want God to talk to you, if you want to know God personally, this book, the Bible, God's Word, will speak to your heart and will help you. Well, have you found Galatians? I want to uh, bring ourselves back into, um, back to where we were kind of beginning to go last week. And if you'll look down in chapter 1 to verse 11, and I want to read verse 11 and 12 of chapter 1. You see it? Verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, 
neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And let's pray. Father, please help us this evening to catch what Paul is trying to emphasize. From the scripture this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at the close of last year, we were really beginning to emphasize the importance of a church being really stable, being really solid. And we had really kind of looked at the example of the church at Thessalonica as a great example of a church that was just exceptional. And the thing that was exceptional about the church at Thessalonica, frankly, was the people there. Matter of fact, if as a pastor you, got, you had the privilege of pastoring sort of like the dream church, the people that did well uh, in spite of circumstances, the people that are just solid, the church at Thessalonica, I think, uh, as I read through and look at different churches and the letters written to them, I think the church at Thessalonica was exceptional. Again, we saw that they had had access to the apostles for three Sabbath days. If you read Acts, you see that the apostles went into the synagogues, into the synagogue on three consecutive Sabbath days, and then subsequently were kicked out of town, run out of town. They preached the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles as well. But after three Sabbaths, basically their ministry in Thessalonica was finished because it was too dangerous for them to stay. And then you read Paul's letter, the introduction, both in the first letter to Thessalonica and the second letter, first and second Thessalonians. One of the things that you see is that Paul was very, very concerned in his first letter. Uh, or he, he, he mentioned his concern in his first letter because he thought that they would be doing poorly. You know, you, you preach the gospel to brand new believers for three Sabbath days, three days. You don't have a high expectation of the level of maturity of that church a couple of years later, would you? I wouldn't. Uh, I have had, and because I have such a pathetic memory, I can't remember all the people, but I have had people that I've led to the Lord, and my expectation is that I wonder if they'll be doing well. Sometimes I think, well, this person's really going to grow, and sometimes I think, well, you know, this person, I don't have the opportunity to help them spiritually. But I've had people get saved and just grow kind of on their own. And the church at Thessalonica was really that way. Paul said that they, their faith was spoken of in the regions round about there. Their, their faith was spoken about. They were known for being faithful Christians throughout the world. Pastor, why do you keep mentioning that? Well, I believe that the Lord is leading this church this year, our church, the church at Fort Lauderdale, not the church at Thessalonica, but the church at Fort Lauderdale, this one, the one you're part of, this particular church, I believe God is leading us to take the next step in our faith, a step of greater faithfulness. Listen, if, if God were to do in our church what I believe He's led our leadership to pray for and what He's led me to preach along the lines of this year, it would be that this year we would take that next step. We would be more faithful this year than we have in times past. And so the church at Thessalonica is a great example of that because the people there determined that they wanted to be faithful to the Lord. Paul said when he sent Timothy to find out how they were doing that he brought back just such a wonderful report about their faith. And he even mentioned it in the letters that the things that I've told you to do, basically I know you're going to do. Isn't it great to give... Hey, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to think along the lines, how many of you have ever hired somebody or employed somebody that when you told them to do something, you knew they were going to do exactly what you told them to do. That's kind of ideal, isn't it? Have you ever had to work with someone that you just needed extra clarity? Uh, the old saying of leadership is, you expect what you inspect. In other words, if you check up on them, they'll probably get it done. But there are just some employees that, man, you just know I'm going to have to really be there and check up on them, or I just know that it's not going to be done the way I want it to be done. And, you know, there's maybe a little bit of a level of, or lack of trust. The church at Thessalonica wasn't like that. But now the church at Galatia, where we're at in our scripture right now, a little bit different. 
If you were to read just a couple of verses in Galatians, or I'm sorry, don't, not this evening, but for your notes, if you're taking notes or for your private study, if you were to read in Acts chapter 16, when Luke mentions the interaction of the apostles and the churches at Galatia, it wasn't one church, it was a lot of churches that were written to in Galatia. One of the things that you note was that they actually had a lot of access to teaching by the apostles. Uh, matter of fact, Acts chapter 16 follows up the council, we call it a council, I don't like the term actually, but the meeting that the apostles had at Jerusalem to discuss the requirements for Gentiles. How Jewish do Gentiles have to be? What part of the law are they required to keep? And after they had been to Jerusalem and Paul and uh, Silas or Barnabas and uh, Bersabbas, those individuals had been at Jerusalem. Then they were going to the regions away from Jerusalem and teaching the things that the apostles and the brethren at Jerusalem had determined God wanted. And so they had, they had, if you will put it this way, advanced training or advanced teaching in Galatia, in the regions about Galatia. The apostles went there and they taught the things that... Uh, that they had determined that all the churches needed to know in Jerusalem. And so I would say that they, the churches at Galatia had great access, not only to the gospel, but they had great access to teaching in the early church. And if you'll just dial back as a church and realize, see, we're coming at it from a perspective of people that were born when the church already had existed for a couple of thousand years. And, you know, when, I don't know what, when the first time you're aware that you knew that the Bible was the Word of God, but, you know, the Bible's been around for a while. When I was a child, I mean, I just grew up in a household where the Bible was open every day. And it was just one of those things you just grew up with and assumed. But the church at Galatia uh, wouldn't have had the entire copy of the Scripture because this letter is just now being written to them. But they're not a Thessalonian church because they have problems. Remember the two phrases that we emphasized last week? Two things that Paul said to the church at Galatia are very different from the church at Thessalonica. In chapter 1, uh, Paul said in verse 6, he said, I marvel, I'm amazed, and not in a good way, by the way. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, into another gospel. He said, I'm amazed that you've messed up so fast. If you want to just phrase it in today's vernacular, you are in an incredible failure. <laughs> I, I fail to comprehend how quickly you have messed up the gospel. How fast you're fallen from the gospel into another gospel. And then in chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul, the first three words that he uses are, O oh, foolish Galatians. And so again, he says, you're amazing, you're, you're, you're an incredible example of failure, if you want to put it in a sarcastic uh, vernacular, which is not my words, by the way. This is the Apostle Paul, it's the Holy Spirit. You know that I'm being nice this year and I'm not saying things like you're incredibly stupid or anything like that. That wouldn't be me. But that's what Paul said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church of Galatia. In other words, you messed up so fast I can't believe it. That's the way he put it. And then he said, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? In other words, did somebody do some kind of magic to, you know, in other words, it's kind of an insult, isn't it? Who hath bewitched you? that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. In other words, how in the world could you believe something when you've seen the truth so clearly? So, this is sort of one of those examples like when you're a child and you're being scolded by an adult and they ask a question. I don't know if your parents ever asked you a question or if your teachers ever asked you a question like, how could you be so stupid? You ever try to give an answer for that question? How could you be so stupid? Well, it starts with DNA. <laughs> That's what I always wanted. My, my parents would kill me if I'd said something smart aleckish like that. But, you know, I started with some inferior genetics to begin with. My parents, you know, 
<laughs> so, um, I'm just like my father, and I have a little bit of a dose of my mother in me. You know, <laughs> like how could you be so stupid? Um, well, you know, I'm I'm genetically predisposed. Probably would not be a good answer for it. But I mean, I don't know. You ever done something like tell me what you were thinking? What were you thinking? Tell me what you were thinking. Did did anybody have adults, teachers, or parents that asked you that? What were you thinking? Tell me what you were thinking. You know, you, well, obviously I was not thinking. You know, <laughs> so. You know, to tell someone what I was thinking while my brain was disengaged, I can't exactly explain for you. But you know what I'm saying. So Paul is giving this, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should uh, not obey the truth before whose eyes. In other words, you saw the truth, and now it's like you never even saw it, the truth. What happened to you? What's wrong with you? That's another one. What's wrong with you? Tell me what's wrong with you. I know that today it's not politically correct for parents to say things like that to children, but they did years ago when I was a youth. They'd say, what in the world is wrong with you? What in the world were you thinking? That sort of thing, those sort of questions. And there's no good answer for it, actually, um, because the reality of it is sometimes we just don't think. Now listen to me. Let's bring it back and let's be honest about this. Sometimes we do, do uh, just not think. Sometimes, even in Christendom, quote, in Christianity, or in saved evangelical churches, sometimes sometimes we have notions that evidence that we really didn't think about them, actually. And uh, the notion that the church at Galatia has gotten caught up in, that Paul acts absolutely pummels in this short letter, is the notion that you're saved by any means other than simple faith and that you remain saved by any other means than simple faith. That is, that you're saved by works or believing that you're saved by faith, that all of a sudden you remain saved by something you do versus by what you believe. So let's look at it, shall we? If you were to read through Galatians and you were to jot notes as you were reading through it of something that Paul is very redundant about, or just continues to repeat, it's the by faith, by works, by righteousness, by love, or it is, in the original language, it is the uh, grammatical structure of the genitive of means. Now, genitive is simply the, 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 the grammatical case that it's in, but means is something we can understand even if we don't know good grammar. Means is this is how this is accomplished or the means by which this is done. Okay, so when we talk about faith and we talk about it as the means or the way that it's accomplished or the way that it's done, that's what we mean by it. So let's look at some of those, for instances, this evening, a phrase that comes up over and again in uh, Galatians. Go to, uh, please, if you will, uh, let's go to... Chapter 2 in verse 16. We'll read verse 16 and then we'll talk about our context for it. Paul says, and he's talking about the Galatian believers who are Jewish. He says, well, let's read verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not, quote, sinners of the Gentiles. Now, that, if you understand the context, is a sarcastic quote. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, you know what the word justified means, right? Let's call on some of our teenagers since we've been talking about this on Saturday, this justification. We've got at least four of our regular teenagers here. Shamir's on my left. and. And justification is an important study in his life right now. Shamir, can you tell me what justification means, what the word means? To be, to be, to be right. To be right or righteous. Yeah. The word righteous, okay? The same word uh, that we use for righteous in, in the New Testament is the same word that is used as a root for justification. In other words, it's a difference between righteous, which means absent, pure, or free from sin. God's standard. And justification means made 
righteous or absent from sin without sin, God's standard. So, I mean, it's justification is a foundational word or concept in salvation. Justification is really the description of what happens when you're saved. Uh, let me put it this way. Heaven, where God is. The place in heaven where God is. Because God is there, is absent of sin. God's holy character, His nature, is righteous. He's without sin. And so if any person who is not righteous were to be in God's presence, my friend, then heaven or where God is would not be a perfect place. Get it? Of course, heaven's a perfect place. There is no sin there because of that's God's character. There can, no be, can be no sin in God's, in God's presence. He is, his presence is absent of sin. So for an individual to go to where God is or God's presence, then he has to be righteous himself. But no person is righteous. The Bible puts it this way, there is none righteous. No, not one. Okay, so there is no righteous person. Justification is the process that an, by which an unrighteous person, that is a sinner, is made righteous for the purpose that they can have access to God. No person has access to God in their sin. So the means for justification is really twofold. There are two possibilities and one's impossible. Just to give you a clue. Okay? The one way to be righteous is to never sin. And only Jesus has ever done that. The second way to be righteous is to be a sinner who is justified. Made righteous. Do you understand the word now? Justification is a word that describes the process of being made to be righteous. Okay, so now the scripture says that we are justified. The Bible says no man is justified by the works of the law, but instead, that would be the word but would mean instead, by the faith of Jesus Christ. So the means to being made without sin or righteous is by the faith of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the one who, God is the one who justifies us when we by faith believe in Jesus Christ. Now if you were to take that phrase by faith, and you were to study it in the New Testament alone, my friend, you'd be amazed at how clear the gospel is presented. How clearly the gospel is presented. In other words, the process of justification by the Scripture is by faith. In other words, no person cleanses themselves, cleans themselves, or eradicates their history of sin. Every person who stands before God without sin does so by means of justification, and the activator, if you will, what activates justification is our faith. By faith. Now, let's dial back just a little bit and go back to Paul's context. When he told the Galatians that they were changed into believing another gospel or good story uh, for justification or means for eternal life, uh, he emphasized the fact that it isn't a matter of the particular man's presentation. That's what he means in verse 9 of Galatians chapter 1 when he tells you, I didn't get this from a guy, I got this from Jesus. That's what he means. Okay, let's do ourselves a favor very, very quickly and let's look at... Uh, Paul doesn't tell us, oh, well he does... But in case it isn't clear, he doesn't tell us the means, specifically the words that Jesus used to describe how to have eternal life or to have the gospel received. But Jesus does, is recorded in the gospels, the method that he used, the means by faith of receiving the gospel, is described actually when Jesus tells Nicodemus how to be born again in John chapter 3. I'm going to try my best to read John 3 without commentary. Can you go there in the Scripture quickly? John chapter 3, the Gospel of John. John chapter 3.
Let's read how Jesus said that a man is justified. If Paul said, I'm preaching to you what Jesus told me, then let's look at what Jesus told Nicodemus. I don't think that any person here would accuse Jesus of preaching different gospels to different individuals. Would you adjust God who's who is equitable and just in all ways? Would he give a, this person a standard for salvation and this person another standard, a higher or a lower standard? No. Christ's gospel is always the same. So let's look at it. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you and to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus said, You have to be born again. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So Jesus said, you've got to be born spiritually. Verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Let's stop there just for a very brief commentary. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, I'm going to tell you how to be born again. But he said, if I have told you what I've seen, and if I've testified that I've seen God, and you don't receive my witness. If I testify uh, to you uh, earthly things, and you don't believe me, how are you going to believe spiritual things? And so Jesus is emphasizing to Nicodemus the ability to believe. That is, the word for believe is faith. Faith is required. You have to have faith in what Jesus said. And now Jesus emphasizes something that is so vitally important. You're a fool if you get directions from someone who's never been there when it comes to heaven and eternal life. There are a lot of people who have notions or even will try to tell someone how to get to heaven, but they've never been there. You've never spoken to a person. By the way, this debunks these myths. You know, individuals that say they have an out-of-body experience that they went to heaven. They may have had a vision. They may have had something happen within the realms of their imagination. But Jesus said no one's ever been to heaven. And I believe Jesus, don't you? So if you have a book that where somebody says, well, this is what heaven's like because I died and I went there. I say, well, you know what? You know, pizza and a hit on the head or ice cream did something to you. And I don't mean un to be unkind to the person. But honestly, that's how highly I esteem a person's telling me what, where heaven is and how to get there. Because the fact of the matter is Jesus came from heaven. If anyone knows how to get there, if anyone knows the facts about heaven, Jesus does. Get it? If anyone can explain the gospel, the means to God, Jesus, who is the gospel, is the best one to explain it. And that is precisely what Paul is saying in Galatians 1.9. When he said, I'm not telling you something a man said, I'm telling you something Jesus said. And if we go to John chapter 3, we can see what Jesus said because he said the same thing to Nicodemus. Now, in verse uh, 14, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. What is the means to eternal life? The means to eternal life is believing in Jesus, or that is the cross of Jesus Christ, if you will be specific according to context. And then we have the verse everyone knows, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he goes on to say how vital it is to do it God's way. 
He, for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Good statement. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What do you have to do in order to be God's enemy or to not have eternal life? What do you have to do? The answer is nothing. You've already done it. Not believing in Jesus is what condemns you. Believing in Jesus is what gives you access to eternal life, and it's just that simple. Friend, don't overcomplicate the gospel. See, the church at Galatia had gotten into keeping the law in order to remain saved. We'll see that in just a minute. They'd gotten into overcomplication of the gospel, but the Scripture says you don't have to do anything to be lost. You're lost because you have not believed. You only have to do one thing to be saved, and that is to believe. And the Bible says, He that believeth is not condemned. Period. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. My friend, if you think, well, I'll just continue the status quo and surely God will accept that I have never aggressively been anti-God or never aggressively denied Him, my friend, you're already condemned until you believe. You do have to make the choice of belief. You say, well, pastor, what if I've never had the chance before? You can't stand before me this evening and tell me you don't have the chance to believe. That's a disingenuous argument. You see, because you could believe right now, right this very instant. You could say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that He's the Son of God. I believe He's the only way for eternal life. In other words, I want Jesus to be my Savior. That's how you believe. And God will save you just for that. But if you don't do that, my friend, you're an unbeliever. And unbelief is a choice. Now we could read on in John chapter 3, and I recommend that you do for your own edification. But let's go back to Galatians chapter uh, 2 this evening for sake of time. So we saw in verse 16, Paul is telling the Jewish element in Galatia, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we, we Jews, have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified. What are those next three words? You see that? Justified, how? By the faith, to be specific, of Christ. So let me ask you a simple question. Again, it's not a complicated question. How is a man righteous or made righteous? By the faith of Jesus Christ. Now let's see it again. Okay, so in verse, right after this we see how we're not justified, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall only some occasional flesh be justified. Is that what it says? For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. My friend, the process of justification involves what percentage of works? Help me with this. Zero percent. If you were to take the works aspect or element of justification and just put a percentage number on it, the percentage number is zero. Zero percent works, 100 percent faith. That's how you want to buy your orange juice, folks. Pure, <coughs> uncontaminated. Did you know that they put, um, that they put uh, some type of essence in orange juice to give it flavor? Because they, they put packets, flavor packets in 100% pure Florida orange juice. Did you know that? Unless you squeeze it yourself, there's no Florida orange juice that's actually pure orange juice. want to let you know that. And that is a lame illustration, actually, for how much faith is involved in our salvation and how much works are involved in our salvation. I want to, I want to propose something to you. I won't be able to prove it all this evening. But I want to propose something to you, and I want you to to be able to think about it or go home and study it. Any individual who thinks that the gospel by faith in Christ alone would involve a believer being more prone to live in sin because salvation is only by faith and not by what you do, that is good works, actually believes the opposite of the truth. The fact is that a person who believes that salvation is by any degree involved with things that you do. Yes, you have to believe in Jesus and you have to, or but you also have to, or you can't neglect, you can't leave out. 
My friend, let me just put it very, very bluntly for you. If there's anything you have to do in addition to faith in order to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and be justified, you'll fail at it. You will. If there's anything required by you more than by faith being justified, in other words, the word justification is 100% entirely passive. It is done to you. When you believe in Jesus, God justifies you. The process of justification is 0% me, 100% God. The requirement of faith is 100% the means, and works are 0% the means to justification. And the Scripture is very expressly clear about it. Matter of fact, Galatians, in Galatians, it is stated over and again in, in different ways. The Bible puts at the end of verse 16, For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You can't do anything to be justified. In verse 17, the Bible says, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, again, that word, that pronoun we, Paul is including himself and others who are Jewish. Those individuals that would have been under the law before they were saved. He said, listen, the law didn't save us. We were saved by faith. So if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we also, we ourselves are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God Forbid. Are you saying then that if we're saved by faith and while we try to be justified by Jesus, that God is the one who is doing the works of the flesh in us? And we can't say that, can we? He goes on to say in verse 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Jesus Christ said that He did, came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus is the fulfilling of the law. If we're dead to the law, we're not dead to the law because of keeping the law. We're dead to the law because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and we positionally were justified by Christ. There's my means to the law not having the ability to condemn me my means to that is not because I've kept the law. My means to it is that Jesus has kept the law and God justified me. My means for eternal life is justification. Now he says in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. So how is it that I can have victory over sin? Well, Paul said I can have victory because I'm dead. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, if you were to go to Romans chapter 4, 5, and 6, you would see this illustrated. And in chapter 7 as well. Because, because we've gone so long this evening, I can't go through everything I'd like to, so we're going to have to finish this thought, and that'll probably be as far as we can get this evening. But I want us to, I want us to engage our uh, minds just for another couple of minutes, if you will, please. I am crucified with Christ. I am, and that's a continuous present. That is, it happened at a beginning point and it has continuing results. I am still, I'm continually crucified or I'm being crucified with Christ. Now this is a very practical question. Was Jesus' crucif crucifixion, that is, Christ's death on the cross, was it figurative, that, it was, that is, it was just sort of, it didn't actually happen, but it was kind of like, could have happened. Sort of like, um, if you were to preach the gospel, for instance, using the illustration of Abraham and being commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac, and God provided a lamb instead of Isaac for Abraham to sacrifice. Now, we know that that lamb was a picture of what? The lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Okay, now supposing Jesus is ready to go into the cross, and God said, okay, enough's enough. We've taken this as far as we need to go to illustrate that Jesus is willing to die and that I'm willing to sacrifice my son. But I'm not actually going to do it. I'm going to sacrifice a, an actual physical sheep or a lamb in place of my son. Is that what happened on the cross? No, what happened on the cross? Jesus actually was nailed there. His life's blood was shed. He was tortured there and he died. He was crucified, actually. So Jesus' death, my friend, is not figurative. It's not mythical. It's actual. It's real. 
And if God has credited me with the work which Jesus did, that is, Jesus lived on this earth, did miracles that proved that He was God, and then He died on the cross without ever having sinned or broken the law, but He died for sin. Himself being sinless, without sin. If a sinless Savior died on the cross, and the Bible says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life, or that there is a substitution, that is, Christ's life for mine. Am I in God's eyes, I'm not being silly or facetious, I'm asking you a real question. If Jesus actually died, and He died in my place, am I actually in God's eyes alive or dead when it comes to sin? Listen, he didn't die for potential sin. He died for actual sin, my sin. And he didn't figuratively die being the perfect son of God. He actually died for my sin. And so, friend, the process of justification leaves me with the condition that I'm dead with regard to sin because Jesus actually died. How much of that position of being crucified with Christ am I responsible for as far as that position of being dead to sin? How much did I do? Zero percent. Jesus did it all. I love the song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain, he washed it. White as snow. What a wonderful chorus that illustrates Galatians chapter 2 and 3. That is my process, my justification in Jesus Christ is 100% the work of Christ. And the fact that I'm dead with regard to sin, it isn't because God thinks that I haven't sinned. God didn't save me because I straightened up. God saved me because Jesus died for the things I did. Now let me ask you a second question that's related to the actual death of Jesus Christ. How dead was Jesus? I'm not being silly. How dead was Jesus when He physically died on the cross? Give me a percent. 100% dead. So how much of His life did He give? All of it. 100% of it. So if God substituted His life for mine, how much of my life did Jesus die for? 100% of it. You say, Pastor, what about after you're saved? How much of my life did Jesus die for? Did He die for me up to the point that I'm born again? Or did He give His life for mine? We'll pick up there next week. Jesus gave His entire life for mine. All of it. Both up until the moment I'm saved and the rest of it. God is not in heaven naive thinking that I don't sin. But God is in heaven saying 100% for 100% is full coverage. And I hope that you can meditate on that thought and be ready to pick up there next week. Father, thank you for justification by faith. God, thank you that the realization that because of the weakness of the flesh, that if I were responsible for any of my justification, God, I'd fail to either be justified or to remain justified. But that the substitution of the entire life of Jesus for my life, God, is sufficient by faith for me to be justified. And Lord, that's what we rest in. Help us to rest in justification this week and understand the gospel more clearly as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot more that I want to preach this evening, and but you, you know, people's attention can only go so far, and we want to get this. We want to really hammer it down. So we'll be one more week in Galatians. Uh, let's go ahead and take some prayer requests this evening.